Hello, and welcome to module 7. Uh, so this module is all about the little extra bits in Python that didn't really fit in anywhere, but it's never a bad idea for beginners to know about. Um, so we're just going to be going through, and I'm just going to be talking about each of these. Uh, they're all pretty self-contained, um, pretty simple stuff. Um, there's no real challenges with this one or anything, so I'll just, uh, I'll just explain what everything is and how to use it. And uh, yeah, that'll be about it. So first off, we have format strings. So format strings are super useful. <clears throat> Basically what they allow you to do is, let's say for example, you had something like you were creating a dashboard for a user, right? And you say, uh, let's say let, let's say somebody's name, right? <clears throat> and we just do name is equal to input, enter your name here. Right, and then after that, you have, uh, let's just say the temperature, let's just say the temperature is, I don't know, like 30 uh, in degrees Celsius, Celsius, Celsius. Um, and I don't know, let's, let's have age, for example, uh, import random. Just say age is equal to random dot randint, uh, somewhere between 18 and 30. Right, and then let's say you're building a uh, a dashboard, right? And so you want to have a string that pops up, and that string that pops up, you want to have all this information inside of it. Uh, so one option you could do is you could do the way that uh, you've probably seen before, which is hello, and then you just do comma name. Let me say something like uh, oh, oops. We say something like hello name um, the temperature, temperature outside is and then you can put something like temperature and then maybe we say something like uh, your age is and then age now we'll just do a comma there cool no oh, oops put a comma there and now we go ahead and oh oops just quickly open a command line, and we go Python module seven. Uh, we get to Kieran, and it says hello, Kieran. Uh, the temperature outside is thirty, and your age is twenty-two. Um, so it's not. This isn't terrible looking, right? Um, but it's also not great. Uh, the problem with this is that, uh, other than because I have syntax highlighting on, uh, it's it's somewhat more obvious as to what's actually happening here. But let's say, for example, you're reading this on a server, trying to figure out what the hell's happening, uh, and I just have something like cat, right? It's actually really hard to tell which are variables and which are not, other than with the commas. And so one way to write this is more clean uh, and more uh, more obvious is that you can actually take your variables. I'll just show you what's going to happen here. So do this. And ooh. This, just like that. And so basically we have one string now, and what we can do is we can put F in front of it, and you can see now it's it's more obvious as to what's actually happening. So hello and then name, we know the name is a variable because it's wrapped in uh, in these quotes here. Uh, they, we say the temperature outside is temperature and your age is age. And we go ahead and run this again. Uh, oops, sorry. We go ahead and run this again. We can just say Kieran, and we get the same thing that we did before. And now when we're looking at it in plain text, like we are right here, because we see this F in front, we know, oh, okay, this is a format string. So we know that there's gonna be, um, there's there's gonna be some templated text that's gonna be using some variables in here. <clears throat> and so this is super useful. Uh, another thing as well with strings that I didn't mention is there's these things called uh, string literals. And I've actually made a post about this on uh, Canadian coding. Um, if I go back over here, whoops. Uh, and we go to posts down here. Uh, there's one called string formatting and literals. And so this post, I'll put a link in the description of this video, uh, but this post here uh, will give you everything you need to know about doing this. But basically with string literals, what you can do is you can do things like um, use backslash n. And so what that does is if I go ahead and say, backslash n, and then we'll put a capital T here, and then we say backslash n here. 
Uh, this basically creates what's called a new line. And so when we run this again, we say Kieran, you can see here we have hello Kieran, and now the next line we have the temperature outside is 30, and your age is whatever the age is. Um, there are other ones like there's tabs, so we could do a new line and a tab each time, for example. Uh, we can actually even start it that way as well. Uh, actually, let's, let's just do this, the first one like this, and then we'll do backslash t, backslash t. And you can see what's going to happen here is the first one's going to be on a new line from the last thing said. And then we'll have a new line, and each time it'll be indented one more time. So if I say Kieran, you can have there, and then it's one tab in, and then another tab in. So super useful. Uh, you can use this in a whole bunch of stuff. You don't have... The, the, the great thing about this is that the... Because it builds just a regular string, you can also use it as a variable. So you can say like, greeting is equal to this, and then that's what the greeting is equal to. Now, one thing, uh, I'm going to print the greeting here. One thing to keep in mind is that these strings only get built once when they first get assigned. So if I do something like this, and then come back here, and I say Kieran, for example, it's going to be Kieran in both cases, and the reason is, even though I've reassigned the name after the first print statement, I haven't recreated the string. So if I want this to have to actually update, I have to explicitly say that I want the string to be rebuilt how it was before. And then it'll show up. So one thing to just keep in mind, because um, this sort of stuff, some people will put, like, for name in names, and then they'll go through a loop, and it'll always be the same name because it's always, it's never actually being updated. I can actually show you an example of that, so you can have like, uh, I don't know, equal to Todd, Derek, and uh, I don't know, James, and then they have greeting, and it says uh, something like. Uh, for name in names, and then maybe the greeting is up here, and we have like names of zero or something. And then they're doing for name and names print greeting. And even though the name variable is being overwritten on each of these iterations, it'll never actually. Uh, It'll never actually update. So if I type in Kieran, it'll always be uh, it'll always be Todd, because it gets built the first time with the names uh, with the zero element of the names, and that's it. So if I wanted to do this properly, then I have to also put the creation of the string inside here, like that, and then now we get the right one. Okay. And the next thing that we're going to take a look at is dates. So dates in Python uh, is something that you don't want to have to create yourself. Um, definitely, you're going to want to use the date time module. So if we go ahead and just say import date time, um, there's a couple of different ways to import this, actually. Uh, so we can import date time regularly, and I'll show you what that looks like. So let's say, for example, we have uh, something like in the examples here, I have the Apollo 11 launch. So let's say, for example, let's do this. And this is the way that this works is you do date time dot date, and then you give it the uh, the numbers afterwards. If you also need time, uh, we can do the Apollo level launch is eleven launches equal to date time dot date time, and it was super convenient. And let's say I don't know the exact times, but let's just say nineteen fifty nine nine thirteen for the date. And you need, uh, what? Oh, you need the day with the uh, with the times inside there. So if you want something more specific, you can use a date time um, object. So if I do something like today is equal to date time dot date time dot now, for example, this will give us our current date time. So print today. What will happen here is if I go ahead and run this, you see we get the timestamp included in here. But if I go date time dot date dot now, oops, I will just get the oh, oops uh, date time dot date dot I think it's today, isn't it? Yeah, 
date time dot date dot today, then we'll get the just the date stamp. So kind of weird. Uh, there's two different objects. There's dates and date times. So make sure you don't get that wrong. Uh, if you want to make sure that it's standardized, what you can actually do is you can do from date time import date just like that, and then now you can just do today is equal to, or you can just say uh, the Apollo. 11 launch is equal to date um, 1959, 9.13. Oops, 1959. Oops, 9.13. Just like that. And then you have the same result. So I would always just do this to be more explicit. And then you have dates directly in there. And it's a class. And you're just, you're all good to go. So I'm just supposed to paste this there. Um, now, if you want to get attributes, because this creates an, because this creates a class uh, instance, what you can do with this is you can just go ahead and go to the Apollo 11 launch, and if you want to get, for example, the year, you can just do dot .year, and let's do this, and we'll do print, and we can print the, uh, actually, this would be good use for format strings. We can go ahead and we can do, for example, f, and we can do year and then whatever the year was. We can do date and say whatever the date was. The day, sorry. And so then we can do uh, month. This is a weird way of doing it. <laughs> uh, then we can say Apollo 11 launched on the month. I'm actually just going to switch these around because otherwise this gets a little bit weird. So we'll just put the month in front of the date, just like that. And then now we can go ahead and run it. Oops. And you'll see we get year, month, day. So super, uh, super useful. Um, it makes you, it makes it standardized really nicely. Uh, and another thing that's great about it is that you can actually check equalities using this. So we can say, for example, um, print. Uh, let's say uh, Apollo. Oops. Apollo eleven launch dot year is equal to nineteen fifty nine, something like this, and we can go ahead and double check to see if this is true. Right. Um, we can also do something like let's say we have another date. So let's say we have Apollo. Or let's just say we have. Uh, comparison date, <laughs> uh, and let's say it's equal to uh, 1930, uh, I don't know, February 15th, something like that, right? So you can see the year is less than this, so that means that intrinsically the date is less than this. So we can just do, uh, we can see if it's less than, for example, so we do comparison date, oops. We can do comparison dates. We can just check to see if one's less than the other. Oops. Which is false because, as you can see, the comparison date is much before the Apollo 11 launch. And uh, and so on and so forth. So you can do any sort of comparison operator with this just in one line by just comparing the date objects directly. You can't compare date time and date objects, though. That's one thing to keep in mind. So make sure that your data is standardized in some way. Either use date times or use dates, depending on what you need. And make sure that your entire application is using one or the other. <clears throat> or alternatively, I believe you can actually explicitly convert. So if I say uh, today is equal to, let's just import date time again. Believe you can do this. Date time dot date time dot now, and then you can say uh, the Apollo Eleven launch is less than date of today. Believe it should do the conversion. No. Yeah, unfortunately, it looks like you can't convert directly to a to a date. So, um, well, it was worth a try. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you if you go ahead and try and do the comparison between a date and a date time object, what you'll run into is it will say can't compare date time dot date time to date time dot date, which is annoying. Um, so yeah, pick one, stick with it, 
and it should be uh, should be good to go. It'll make your life much easier. So uh, there's also stuff with time zones in here as well as a whole bunch of di uh, time zone things pr built in. So uh, definitely worth taking a look at. In the additional information, I'll include some notes about where to find the uh, standard library documentation on the daytime module as well for any additional information that you might need. Okay, so let's talk about some files. So, uh, within Python, or well, I guess uh, in programming languages more generally, most, most programming languages follow the same structure as Python. It's just that Python's a bit more implicit about how it works. Um, there, there's three different steps. So, the, a file needs to be opened, it needs to be read from or written to, and then it needs to be closed, quote-unquote. Um, if you ever worked in any low-level languages, then you know that this is kind of annoying. Um, Python has a really simple syntax for doing this. Uh, and so I'll show you that first, and then I'll show you what's actually a little bit, a little taste of what's happening under the hood. Um, so let's just grab the text from the example. Um, and so basically, so this, this text that I have here, I want to write it into a file called poem.txt. And so there's a couple things to note here. Uh, the first is that there's a new statement that you've probably never seen before called the with operator. Um, and so we're saying with open, and then we have to include the file name, and then we have to include the type that we want to do. And so inside the standard library documentation, there'll be information about all these different types that are typically single letters. So R is for read, uh, W is for write, uh, WB is for writing by bytes. Uh, like there's, there's a whole bunch of different ones here. Uh, w plus basically just writes, and then if the file doesn't already exist, it goes ahead and creates it. And so um, what you do is you say with uh, open and then those the file file uh, name and then whatever the uh, the open type is. In this case, we want to write to something, uh, and then we say as poem file. And so this as statement basically allows us to say that something, that this becomes basically a file object. And so that file object, we then write the text to it and that will write it to the file. <clears throat> so if we go ahead and run this now and I run uh, Python module seven, then what's happened is that it's now created, whoops, it's now created a file called poem.txt that I can go ahead and open and we have the text in there as it is. So it's pretty simple. Um, this is very easy to use, especially if you come from some other languages. This is much simpler to use than most languages. Um, but this might seem a little bit magic-y at first for a lot of people coming from other languages. Uh, but all, all this is what's called a context manager. So I'll leave some information about what that means, but it's, it's quite an advanced topic. Um, the long and short of it is that uh, this just simplifies doing what I'll show you right now. So normally what you'd have to do is you'd have to say uh, poem file is equal to the open statement that we had before. So poem file is equal to that. And then we would have to do something like um, poem file dot write so the same thing here and then we'd have to do poem oh, whoops file dot close just like that so it doesn't seem like there's a ton so I'll take poem one dot txt just for example and I'll go ahead and run this again and it created another file uh, that you can see here called poem one and it's the exact same thing right so it doesn't seem like this. You're, you're probably thinking to yourself, this only saves one line. Like this doesn't. The, the, why? Like who cares? We can use either of these two. So the with statement, um, what it does is it closes the file. Which, um, if you've ever worked in any lower level languages, you know that if you don't actually close a file, nothing gets written to a file. Everything that would normally be written to a file goes to what's called a file a uh, file buffer. And then what happens is you do what's called a file buffer flush. And that file buffer flush is when you actually write, quote unquote, write to the file. Um, and so if you actually forget to do this close, the file won't have anything saved to it. Nothing will actually get saved. And if your program ends, then it means the file gets deleted and none of the content actually gets saved. So you need to remember to have this, which a lot of people kept forgetting to do. Um, on top of that, 
there are certain kinds of errors that can happen when writing files that can cause uh, pretty <laughs> horrific side effects. Um, and in lower level languages, this is a real pain to deal with. Uh, there's certain types of file exceptions that can, can cause real issues. Most languages nowadays protect against them, um, but there's still some weird stuff that can go on. And basically what this with statement does is it catches those errors for you. So let's say, for example, you get uh, two thirds of the way through writing uh, this text to um, the file then let's say that there's some sort of weird error that happens in the back end of the system. Let's say that, I don't know, for some reason there's some script that's automatically deleting the file at the same time as you're trying to write it or something obscure like that. Um, what the close will do, or what the with statement will do, is it'll just handle that error for you, uh, and it will either bail out and partially write the file, or alternatively it will roll back to the previous version of the file, depending on what point it's currently at. So this with statement actually does a lot for you that you don't necessarily see. Um, it's really powerful and definitely if you're ever doing anything with files I would highly recommend just sticking to using the with statement instead of trying to write this yourself uh, Because otherwise you can get into trouble But um, if you ever need to do anything fancy with files like you want to implement your own custom way of Doing this with statement because that's also possible in Python um, You can actually write your own version of open um, That has some fancy things if you're trying to do especially uh, weird things with servers <clears throat> that becomes kind of useful because there's certain default behaviors you might want to overwrite, uh, then you can go ahead and do that. And so understanding that these are the steps that are taken uh, is still a good thing to know under the hood. Um, but for 99% of your use cases, you're just going to want to do the with statement and not even worry about any of that extra complexity. <clears throat> so one thing that I did forget to cover here uh, with the files is actually reading. So I'll just go ahead and show you what that looks like. Uh, so we'll just get this text again. We'll go ahead and, oh, whoops. We'll go ahead and just quickly open up a command line and we'll go ahead and just run it to create the poem. So now we have poem.txt as we did before. And within poem.txt, what we'll now do is we will get rid of text here. And what we can do is we can do r. And instead of doing dot write, we wanna do dot read, just like that. And we want to do text is equal to that. And now we can print text. And what will happen here is when we go ahead and run it, it just goes ahead and reads the file and does that. Uh, you also do have the option if you want to. Um, so you can open the text here. And then let's say you want to iterate line by line. Uh, you could also do this where you do uh, for line in home file dot read line print line or whoops print line print next line just so you can see what happens here I'll just go ahead and delete that variable and then now oh, whoops if we go ahead and run it you'll see we get each of the, like we actually get each of the, the first letters of the line, so we actually want to read lines. And then what happens is that it actually reads each line as you go through. So we got the first line and then it says next line and then it says that it's got the next line, then it prints next line, so on and so forth. So that's how you actually iterate through each of the line in, each of the lines in a file if you need to as well. So uh, yeah. Um, that's that should cover files. So now, now we can go ahead and move on. So after talking about J or after talking about files, uh, let's get into <laughs> JSON files. So um, one of the most useful things about having a Python dictionary is that uh, with a Python dictionary, you can actually use what's called JSON. And so if I go ahead and just grab this, just as an example, we can actually import the JSON module. And so we have a dictionary, right? And so what this dictionary allows us to do is if you've ever worked in JSON file format, basically JSON is, uh, it, it wasn't intended to be used this way necessarily. Um, it's basically used to just store information. Uh, but Python, it just so happens serendipitously that Python's uh, dictionary uh, system that was set up is pretty much a one-to-one -one translation in most cases. Uh, read the documentation for a couple of the exceptions of that. Um, so 
what you can do is you can actually save files as JSON files uh, directly with Python. Particularly, you can save um, dictionaries as a as basically a one to one translation from Python to JSON objects and back again. Uh, and it basically is just a nice way of, uh, of serializing data. And so JSON is a very common format. So if I go ahead and run this, uh, JSON, if I just open it up, the file that was created by this, uh, JSON looks exactly like a dictionary. I mean, you can you can see if, if I basically if I do this, it's basically a dictionary when you're reading it. And uh, JSON is a well accepted standard. JSON is I don't know of any languages actually that don't have a JSON library with them. Um, most APIs will have some sort of a JSON endpoint. Um, even more complicated things will typically have a JSON endpoint, and so it's a really useful specification to understand. Uh, unlike things like config parser, which is a Python standard um, for writing configuration files, uh, JSON is accepted cross language and cross platform, so it's very, very well known. <clears throat> Um, and Python by default has a uh, has a library for dealing with it, so uh, it's great. So basically, it, it works exactly the same as a regular file. You just open it as a JSON file. The only difference that you have is that instead of using uh, JSON file dot write, what you actually do is you do JSON dot dump, and then you give it the dictionary that you want to put in there, and then you give it the JSON file, which is the actual open file object. Um, and then that's in, and that basically dumps it directly into there. There's another option where you have json.dumps with an S, not a Z. Um, and basically what that will do, I'll just run it, oh, whoops. Uh, it, it just takes the, uh, the data and it creates a string. Uh, so let me, let me grab an example from the documentation because it's probably better. Uh, I, I haven't found a real use for this. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of it, but basically if we take a look right here, what you can see here is that you can give it strings and it basically converts into JSON format. I, I, I don't find it incredibly useful, um, so I wouldn't even really bother with it. I basically just, I've only ever used dump instead of dumps, and it's, uh, <laughs> well, it's worked for me so far, so. Um, yeah, so, that, so that's how you actually uh, write to a file. Uh, now let's talk about reading from files. So to read from a file, you basically just swap the dump for load. And so basically when you do this dot load uh, function, you want to pass it the file that you're opening. And so in this case, you want to make it read. And then you basically just go in there and read it. And then that reserializes it back into the user. And so I can go ahead and get rid of this. And we can go ahead and oops, print user. And when we run it, oh, whoops. JSON decoder error. There we go. It's because I accidentally deleted everything. Um, so if we go ahead and run this again, there we go. Our uh, our JSON, we're able to serialize our data to a JSON file from a dictionary and then back out again to a dictionary as needed. So uh, yeah, so, J so JSON is a super useful format and definitely worth learning and it's also super useful in Python just because of this library. So um, yeah, I guess let's go ahead and let's move on. Okay, so let's talk about the last part that I wanted to cover, which is uh, operating system calls. So there's two different good modules for doing this in Python. Uh, there's OS and Sys, which are both included in the Python standard library. So OS is more about uh, finding out information about your operating system uh, and also your file system. So if you ever want to look at things like uh, different file directories, if you want to find out what's inside those file directories and that sort of stuff, uh, then OS is great for that. <clears throat> Sys is more for doing actual uh, like function calls that you'd want to make to the operating system itself. So if we go ahead, for example, and import OS, and we go print, oh, whoops, print OS dot, uh, let's say OS dot name, for example. What this will do is this will give you information about uh, about the operating system. So in this case, NT, which for those of you who are on Windows, this is a 
uh, homage back to one of the older versions of Windows that existed. They've just never actually changed the OS name. Uh, on Linux, I can't remember what this is called, um, but basically you can you can do fancy things with this information. Like for example, uh, you can print, which I'll grab here. If you're on Windows, you can go ahead and print you are on Windows. And if you're on Mac or Linux, for example, you can print you are on Mac or Linux. So you see here only you are on Windows shows up because I'm on Windows. Uh, there's other cool things in OS. Uh, so for example, there's some weird stuff when you're doing dealing with files uh, about having the right um, slash. So on Windows, you need to use a forward slash to delineate differences between paths, whereas on Linux, you have to use a backslash. Uh, and same with Mac OS. So inside here, you can just use os.sep, and then it doesn't matter which operating system you're on, it'll print the right one. <clears throat> there's also, there's a couple of other ones as well. There's a lot of good stuff on here. Uh, like for example, uh, I think it's, I thought it was env. Right? Maybe I'm wrong. Is it get env? Yeah, get env. Uh, and so this will allow you to get environment variables. So for example, you can get the environment variable user profile on Windows, and this will be uh, where your main C drive is. So for example, you have C users Kieran. Uh, this is useful for doing things where I mentioned earlier, uh, whoops, about the F strings. You can, for example, do something like this, where you put everything inside here, whoops, inside here. And then with this, we can just do uh, os.sep, and then we can just do downloads, for example. And then if I go ahead and run this, oh, whoops, I uh, used Oops. There we go. And so now if we run this, you see you get C users Kieran downloads, which means that I can now save a file to my downloads folder if I needed to. Um, so this is super useful. Um, if you've ever done any sort of sysadmin stuff, then you know how useful this can be. <laughs> uh, and then sys is more for, um, again, like I said, doing system calls. So if we go sys.argv, for example, um, if anybody's ever done any low-level programming, then you'll know um, what this is. It's basically, uh, it, it basically prints, it basically set, tells you what's been added. So let's say, for example, I say one, two, three, four, five, six. It, it will, oh, what's happening? This object is not callable. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's say this to RV zero, for example. Mm, what's happening? Oh, my bad. Sorry, this is a list. In Python and so you can see here when I make this call it, it grabs the arguments that happen after the initial Python declaration so it's it print it grabs module 7.py which is the Python file it's currently running and it grabs the number so for example if you wanted to know like uh, something like this oh, oops. you want to say something like this and you want to say you are currently running a file sys.rv0, then you could say you are currently running file module 7.py, which is what the file Python file that we're running currently is. Um, there's a couple, there's, there's a bunch of other ones that are inside here. Uh, so sys.path uh, is another good one, version info is good. Uh, sys.exit is somewhat useful if you want to have a Python file that you want to make sure at a certain point that it bails out of. Uh, let's say, for example, it hits a certain error uh, and you want to make sure 100% that it basically kills the entire script. Sys.exit's a good way to do it because uh, it will just, it'll, it'll kill it right away. Uh, I mean, you can really tell, but if I go like this, for example, and then print like hi, uh, you'll see that it doesn't, it won't ever get there because it just it kills the Python process the second it gets there. <clears throat> And uh, yeah, so that's the last thing that was on my extras list. Uh, like I said, there's no, uh, there's no challenges or exercises or anything really. This is just to give you an idea of where to look for, for different patterns and where to find different things inside Python. Uh, there's nothing really to necessarily master. This is just kind of things that exist in Python that you should be aware of. Um, so be sure to read the additional information inside the post on the website to get more uh, information. And uh, if you are taking the Python course, then obviously this is the seventh module. You'll see by the time that, um, hopefully by the time that you're watching this, there will be a module eight inside of here. Uh, I haven't yet written it as you can 
currently see. Uh, but once I write it, that will be information on where to go from here, where to, um, <clears throat> what projects you can take a look at and that sort of stuff uh, to start working on um, to further your Python career. And also keep in mind that down the road in the year, I will be also doing another Python course for free. Uh, that will be Python 202 and that will be Intermediate Python. Uh, later on in the year, I'll be doing Python 303, which will be advanced Python, and then I'll be doing some some free course specializations as well. So things like web development, uh, and uh, there'll be a, there'll be a couple others as well. So if you are interested in any of that, be sure to subscribe on YouTube, uh, keep an eye on the website, uh, or also check out the Twitch channel. I did my first uh, live stream today, so that's twitch.tv slash Canadian And so if we go on there, um, this is where I've been doing uh, some development stuff so if you want to see some live streams of me doing development i did a python stream today starting an automation tool uh, so be sure to come check this out as well uh, yeah so thank you for watching and hopefully i will see you in uh, module 8 once it's actually been written